Hi there. This is your lecture 8 for Math 2208 at Mount St. Vincent University. It's September 29th, 2024. To start with, a practice problem using the empirical rule. What I'd like you to do is pause the video, read through this problem, try to answer it, and once you get an answer, then continue. So pause now. So I'm back. Here's the scenario. We're supposing that the weight of a watermelon follows a normal distribution with a mean of 10 kilograms and a standard deviation of 2. So what I'm stating here in the blue is a model. This is a model for the population of watermelons. This model is pictured over here on the right. And you can see we have a normal distribution centered at 10. And then on the horizontal axis, I have uh, on one side 8, 6, and 4. On the other side, 12, 14, and 16. Now, what are those numbers? 8 and 12, that represents plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean value, right? Because the standard deviation is 2. 10 plus 2 is 12. 10 minus 2 is 8. The 6 and 14 represents the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. The 4 and 16, the mean plus or minus three standard deviations. So we can now use the empirical rule to calculate areas. Areas correspond to probabilities or proportions. So for the first question, if a grocery store buys 125 watermelons, how many would you predict to be less than 8 kilograms? So all we have to do is realize that the area from 8 kilograms to the left represents 16% of the total area. And so what is 16% of 125? Well, 0.16 times 125 gives 20. And so the answer to this question, 20 watermelons will be less than 8 kilograms. At least that's our prediction. That is our prediction. Next question, how many of the 125 watermelons would you predict to be between 12 kilograms and 14 kilograms? So this one's a little bit more tricky, but let's have a look. We know that if we start at 12 and go to the right, that represents 16% again. Why? Because 12 is one standard deviation above the mean. So we have that. We also know that if you go start at 14 and go to the right, that represents 2.5%. And so the area we need is between 12 and 14. And so 16% minus 2.5% will give us the answer. And so they can expect... 13.5% or about of 125 watermelons to be between 12 and 14 kilograms in mass. So 13.5% of 125 is about 17 watermelons in total. Okay, great. So let's see what's next. Uh, yes, so last time we talked about the normal probability plot, also called a QQ plot. And what I showed you there is that we use a QQ plot to assess whether our data is consistent with a normal population model. And so here, I'm going to show you three QQ plots. And I want you to think for a moment and ask yourself, is the data consistent with a normal population model? So in the first case, here's our QQ plot. The QQ plot, if it looks like this, does that tell you that the data is consistent or not consistent with a normal population model? Just give you a second to think about that. So in this case, the data is not consistent with a normal water model. And how do we know that? It's just simple. If these individual data points fall in a straight line, or roughly so, then we can say the data is consistent with a normal model. If the data points do not fall in a straight line, they're curved, like you see here, then we would say not consistent. OK, so next case, consistent or not consistent? Surely you're saying consistent. In this case, the data is consistent with a normal model because most of those data points fall in a straight line. Last one, consistent or not consistent? Now, a lot of you may be thinking, I'm not sure. Some of you may be thinking, this is not consistent. And the reason would be, those data points do not fall in a straight line. And I would agree with that. 
if you look at this and you say this data is not consistent with a normal population model because these data points don't fall in a straight line, that's fine. Somebody else might say, well, they don't fall in a straight line, but they're pretty close. So I would say this is consistent with a normal population model. Either answer is okay with me as long as you give the right reason. The point is, uh, for purposes of this course, probably you'll be shown a plot like A or like B. In other words, you'll be showing cases where obviously the data is not consistent in the case of A or is consistent in the case of B, an obvious scenario. If you are faced with a case like plot C, where it's sort of borderline, it's kind of hard to tell which it is, then pick one and give a good answer. Explain why you think so. And if your explanation is correct, I will mark you correct with that. So in this case, uh, myself, I would say uh, this data is not consistent with the normal model because it does have a bit of a curve in it, this, these, the way the data points are lined up. So uh, that's not consistent. Somebody else might say, again, somebody else might say, well, it's, these data points are roughly in a straight line. So I would say we, it's, 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 it's fairly consistent with a normal model. Right, borderline case. Okay, here's one more example question. This came from the last assignment. And so here I'm pretending that Dr. Chris received emails from 55 different students during the fall of 2021. And the question is, using the bar graph alone, sorry, it's not a bar graph, it's a histogram. Using the histogram alone, what is the median number of emails sent? So you had a question like this on the previous assignment. So in case you got that wrong the first time, uh, I want to make sure you understand in case you see something like this on the midterm. So let me give you a few minutes to think about it. Come up with an answer. You can pause the video if you need time uh, and then resume once you have an answer. So what's the secrets of finding the median from a histogram? Well, for one thing, you need to remember the median is just the middle number once you place numbers in order from smallest to largest. And so in this case, we have 55 data points. The median is the 26th data point. So the only question is, where is the 26th data point? Well, if you look carefully, you see that the first two bars, actually, I should say bins, the first two bins of the histogram, the first one contains seven data points. The second one contains 26 data points. And so the first two bins account for 33 of all the data points. And what, is, what, what number appears in the first bin? These are, represent the students, the seven students who sent one email. In the second bin, it's the, it's the 26 students who sent two emails each. The median is the 26 data point. The 26 data point is in the second bin. That's, that's the idea. It's in the second bin. And so that means the median is two emails. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about linear regression. This is the next topic uh, for the course. Uh, before that, let me remind you of your homework. So you should start reading Module 5 if you haven't yet. Also, let me remind you that you have a MyLab homework assignment. It's due Friday first Friday of October. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow, Monday, last day of September. Tuesday, you go back to school. That's the first. The following Friday is the due date for this assignment. And this is assignment two. I don't think this is assignment two, by the way. I think that's assignment four. Yeah, in any case, uh, it's the assignment you see here. It's homework for chapters five and six, the normal model and correlation. Um, also, as part of your, your effort to master the material in this course, I'm going to just let you know right now that there has been a skill check uh, posted, the fourth skill check. This is for Chapter 7. It's the linear regression. It's the stuff we're going to be doing in this lesson. That skill check is already there. The video solution to that skill check hasn't been posted yet, probably by Wednesday this week. That will be posted. I'll let you know when that's the case. So some important dates. Coming up in two weeks, we have our second quiz. That's going to be during the week of October 7th. It's going to open on that Thursday and close on Saturday, as, as the first quiz did. 
And let's not forget, we have a midterm two weeks after that. October 23rd is our midterm. It's written in class, a full hour and 15 minutes. If you have accommodations, you need to arrange with, with uh, what's it called, accessibility services, uh, for them to give you a separate time and place to write the midterm. So I'll leave that up to you if you are a student with accommodations. Right, so before we get to the new stuff, I want to just give you one more practice problem. So here, we're back in Madagascar. We're imagining that we're measuring the length of grass snakes that we just catch at random in the environment. And here we're going to assume that we have a population model with a population mean of 250 centimeters in length, a population standard deviation of 20 centimeters. And the question is, what proportion of snakes in the population would you predict to be between 221 centimeters and 273 centimeters in length. Here we're assuming that length follows a normal distribution with the parameters that you see in the upper left of your screen. So this is a bit of a challenge. I suggest that you pause the video now. You just take this question as far as you can. And when you get stuck or when you get final answers, resume the video and you will see the solution. Okay, welcome back. Let's see what's going on here. Um, one of the important things to remember when you're faced with a question that's about the normal distribution is at some point you have to take a value of interest and standardize it. Remember standardization? You subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So in this case, we have two values of interest, 221 and 273. You can think of these as boundaries. And we're looking at the, basically, we're going to be looking at the area between these two boundaries. And so we have to take each of these numbers and standardize them. So the first step is standardization. And so that's always the same. You simply subtract the population mean and divide by the population standard deviation. So in the first case, 221 minus 250 divided by 20 we see that 221 centimeters is 1.45 standard deviations to the left of the mean. 273 is 1.15 standard deviations to the right of the mean. So standardization is the first step. Now, at this point, you might not be sure what to do next. What I suggest is you draw a picture. Having a picture in front of you can clarify your thinking. And so here we have a picture. Now we're working with the standard normal distribution. And we have our two boundaries, minus 1.45, 1.15. Our objective is to find the proportion in between these two boundaries. So we have to look at the area shaded in blue. Now, in order to get that area, we need to now look at the Z table. We need to look up both of these bounds and get the area, one for the lower tail, one for the upper tail. So check it out. We need to calculate the area in the blue shaded region here where the, where the Z score is between minus 1.45 and plus 1.45. Starting with the lower bounds, there's minus 1.4. And the second decimal place is... 5, so 0 0.05, and we find that the area in the lower tail is 0 0.0735. In other words, 7.35%. So we can now add that to the picture. The area in the lower tail is 7.35%. Let's do the same for the upper tail. Uh, looking up 1.15, we look up 1.1. And then we go over to the 0 0.05. And we find that the area to the left of this Z score is 0.8749. What we want is the area to the right. So what do we have to do? We have to subtract. So the area now in the upper tail is 12.51%. That's 100%. Minus 87.49%. And so now we can figure out the area in between these two bounds, the blue shaded region, 
That's just a matter of taking a difference. So what proportion of snakes in the population would you predict to be between 221 and 273 centimeters based on this normal population model? We would predict 100% minus the lower tail minus the upper tail, giving us 80.14%. So about 80% of the population of snakes, uh, according to this model, uh, will have lengths between 221 and 273 centimeters. Okay, so now on to the new stuff. Here, we're going to introduce the idea of linear regression. This Actually, this topic is going to take two classes, Chapter 7 today, Chapter 8 we'll be doing uh, this, coming, this coming Wednesday, assuming you're watching this on, uh, let's say, Monday, September 30th, or Tuesday, October 1st. So here we're going to continue with this idea that we're measuring the length of grass snakes and also the mass. And in the end, we want to model so that we can take the mass of a snake and predict what its length is. We want to make a predictive model. Now, looking at this scatter plot, can you think of one or two words that describe the nature of the association between mass and length? What kind of words would you would you think of? You might say there's a positive linear association between mass and length that is apparent in the data. Also, it looks like a fairly strong association. How do we measure the strength of that linear association? What's the key word here? To measure the strength of the linear association, we use the sample correlation. What do you think the sample correlation is in this case? Just take a guess. Well, we know there's a strong association. Why? Because there's not very much scatter in this data. What I mean by scatter is if you imagine you drew a straight line through those data points, then the distance between each data point and that line on average is not very big, not a lot of scatter. So I would guess 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that for the correlation. Turns out to be 0 0.92. So it's actually a very strong, positive, linear association. Now, the point of all of this is, again, we want to make predictions. But the correlation coefficient, this, this sample statistic, is not sufficient to make predictions. Correlation is not a predictive model by itself. We need something more. The thing that we need is a linear regression model. So let's again remind ourselves what the data is. On the left, you see our, our coordinate system. Last time we met, I called this a Cartesian coordinate system. It's called a Cartesian coordinate system because the person who invented it was a French guy whose name was Descartes. But that doesn't matter. Think of it as just an XY coordinate system. Okay, so here XY, we're putting X on the horizontal axis, Y on the vertical axis, we have mass in kilograms, uh, we have length in centimeters. X is called the predictor or the independent variable. Y is called the response or the dependent variable. The point is we want a model where the length of the snake depends on its mass. And then we use that model to make predictions of length given mass. Okay, so that's the terminology. Now, to make predictions, we need to find a straight line equation that models the linear association observed in the data. So a straight line association would be something like this. This straight line has an equation. This equation, maybe to you, looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. It looks like a bunch of nonsense. So let's just look at each of these symbols, make sure we understand precisely what they represent. So first, again, x and y, these are observed values. In the equation, we have an x on the right on the, on the right hand side. That x is an observed value. The y hat is not observed. Instead, the y hat is called a fitted value. So the y hats are values 
on this red line. For example, suppose we have a snake whose mass is 4.81 kilograms. What is the predicted length of that snake according to this red line equation? Well, we just go, we just go up to the red line and then go over to the y-axis. And if there was a number there, we could read it off. In other words, y hat, you see, is a predicted value for a snake that's 4.81 kilograms in mass. Y hat is a point on the line, on our model straight line, uh, and it's called a fitted value. Right, so we, now we know what the y hat is, and we know what the x is. x is an observation. y hat is a fitted value that exists on the straight line. We need now just to figure out what b0 and b1 are. So any straight line equation is characterized by two model coefficients. The first is called the y-intercept. That is b0. It gives the value of y hat when x is equal to 0. So you can see on the left where that big black dot is, that's b0. You see that is where x is equal to 0. It gives a y value when x is equal to 0. That's called the y-intercept. The second model coefficient is the slope. We call that b1. It gives the amount by which y hat will change when x is increased by one unit. So what I mean is this. If you go to the right by one unit in mass, there's a distance, a vertical distance that you change. That vertical distance is the slope. So let's look at a concrete example. Here we have our same set of data, and we have a red line equation moving through that data. And on top of the graph, we actually have the equation. So here, the intercept is 85 centimeters. The slope is 30 centimeters per kilogram. Now, just want to make a note that in my lab, they often do not use y hat. Instead, they take the name of the response variable and put a hat over it. So you see here it says length with a, with a little triangle thing over it. That's the hat. That length with a hat on it represents a, a, a fitted value for length. Also, instead of using x for the dependent var independent variable or the predictor, they use the name of that independent variable. In this case, that's mass. And so you can see length with a hat on it equals 85 plus 30 times mass. So they can write it that way. Or you'll see it the way I'm writing it, y hat equals, and using x and y hat together. Okay. So there's two ways you might see it. That's the point. Now here's a question I want you to think about. In this particular instance, what is the meaning of the slope? B1 equals 30 centimeters per kilogram. Pause the video if you need to. Take a moment. Think about it. Come up with an answer. Okay, so returning. So here we have our picture, our sort of diagram of what a linear equation model looks like. Uh, before talking about the slope, I want to talk a little bit first about the intercept. Here. When x is equal to 0, y hat is going to be 85 centimeters. What does that mean? Well, 0 would represent the length of a snake. And 85 centimeters, sorry, take it back, sorry. 0 would represent the mass of a snake, and 85 centimeters would be its predicted length. Now, does that make sense to you? Probably not. Because a snake cannot be zero in mass. There is no such snake. So in this case, the point is, the intercept, even though there has to be one in the model equation, the intercept cannot be interpreted. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any, any sense in real life. But it still has to be there. The slope, on the other hand, is very easy to interpret. All we're saying with this slope 
is if you increase the mass of a snake by one kilogram, the model predicts an increase in the length of that snake by 30 centimeters on average. So the model predicts a 30 centimeter increase in length for every one kilogram increase in mass on average. Okay, so let's consider a particular observation. I'm going to pick one point where x is equal to 4.81 kilograms and y is equal to 241.53 centimeters in length. So this represents one particular snake in our sample. So the fitted value for this data is indicated here in red. So for a snake of, of 4.81 kilograms in mass, the fitted value, as you can see, is a value on that red line, on our model equation. Of course, we can calculate the fitted value using the model equation. This is something you're going to be asked to do. So how do we do that? Calculating a fitted value. So first, we write down the equation. This is the equation for our model. That's the red line. We're looking at a snake whose mass is 4.81 kilograms. So we have to put 4.81 where we see x in that equation. And now we just simply do the arithmetic. 30 times 4.81 plus 85. If you try that yourself, that will give you 229.30 centimeters. So in other words, the fitted value is y hat equals 229.30 20, centimeters. Meaning, the model predicts that a snake with a mass of 4.81 kilograms will be 229.30 centimeters in length on average. Okay, now, let's talk about individual differences. Why is this snake not the same length as what the model predicts. In fact, look at all those green dots. None of the snakes are exactly on our line of best fit, on our model line. Which is to say, in every case, the real length of the snake is something different than what's being predicted. Why are those differences there? It's because the model is predicting an average for every given value for mass. There's an average length we expect the snake to be on average, but that doesn't account for individual differences. And so the difference between any given snake and its predicted value is due to what we will call individual differences. We call these differences residual errors. And I just noticed um, I have an extra S there. So these are called residual errors. So the difference between an observed and fitted value is called a residual error or, more simply, just a residual. And a residual is given the symbol E because E is the first letter in the word error. So the error is just equal to an observed value, Y, minus the fitted value, Y hat. And that represents just that distance, the vertical distance between a fitted value and an observed value. So in this case, the residual is simply it's 241.53 minus 229.30. It's the observed value minus the fitted value. It's 12.23 centimeters. That's the residual error or the residual, and again, every single data point has a residual. If there's 25 data points, there's 25 fitted values, and there's 25 residuals. 
Notice that the residual in this case is positive. That's because the observed value is bigger or above the line. For observed values below the line, of course, the residual will be negative, and you can see that roughly half the residuals are positive and half are negative. That's usually the case, roughly. Now, I want to point out something from, from a previous lesson. We, you might recall a deviance is the difference between a sample value and the sample mean. So it's y minus y bar. Do you remember what we use deviances to measure? Think of the one word. We use deviances to measure, you might have said spread, you might have said variation, you might have said variance, or even standard deviation. So the deviance appears in blue in this equation. This is the equation for the sample standard deviation. That's a sample statistic. This is where we use deviances. Now, I'm pointing out that a deviance and a residual look very similar. The only difference is the context. So the difference between an observed and fitted value in linear regression is your residual or residual error. And you can see it's the same kind of idea. Okay, now let's just summarize everything we've talked about so far. First thing is uh, we're looking for a linear equation to model the linear association between, in this case, mass of a grass snake and the length of a grass snake. The best fitting line otherwise called the regression line, has this form. There's a y hat equals b0 plus b1x. b0 is the intercept, as you can see on the diagram. b1 is the slope, as you can see on the diagram. So the best fitting line predicts the average response for each value of x. There are two model coefficients, the intercept and the slope. Okay, so now let's look at something practical. Um, oh, yes, before we do that, yes. You might ask yourself, where do we get B0 and B1? Well, I'll tell you, these will be given to you. A computer is going to do the calculation. You will be given values. However, you might have to read these values from a table. For example, uh, in the case you're going to see here, I put the data into Minitab. And I used Minitab to calculate the model coefficients B0 and B1. And Minitab reported those in a table. So I'm going to show you um, that. But before I do that, I first want to answer, what is the computer actually doing when it makes these calculations? So this is just to get the concept. So the idea is this. If we, if we just remove this line. We can see in our data, there's clear evidence of a strong positive linear association. And so you could imagine very easily uh, a straight line fit, let's say right there. And you could say, okay, I'm going to use this line as my model to get predictions. The point is, there's lots of ways you can draw a line through this data. You can, you can change the slope a little bit. You can change the intercept a little bit by moving the this, uh, this graph up and down, sorry, this straight line up and down a little bit. And every time you put a line down, you can see you're going to get some residuals. Put the line here, you can see, for example, for, for the data point um, in the middle here, I'm not sure, I think you can see that cursor. If we move the line a bit lower, that residual error gets bigger. If we move it a bit up, that residual error gets smaller, but other residual errors get bigger. So the, the point of this is wherever you put this line, and remember, where the line goes depends on its parameters, the intercept and slope. Wherever you put it, there's going to be residuals. So the point is here, the computer finds the unique, single unique line whose coefficients, the, the B0 and B1, minimize the standard deviation of the residuals. In other words, the line of best fit is the one whose coefficients, B0, B1, minimize the spread 
or the variation of the residual errors. So there's one single unique line of best fits. Now again, you don't have to do the calculation, but what you will need to do is give your mini tab output, write down what the equation is for the line of best fit. So here's an example. Uh, the scenario is this. Uh, we imagine that a chess club randomly selected 25 students aged 20 to 10 who had never played chess before. The students were given the opportunity to use chess training software for as many hours as they wanted over a period of 60 days. The chess playing strength of each student was then, ass then assessed. So what are we looking at in the graph? The horizontal axis is the number of hours a student spent using the software. The vertical axis represents the playing strength uh, at the end of the 60 days. And so what do we see? There is a positive linear association, and it looks like it's quite strong between these two variables. The red line you see here is the line of best fit. It's the line whose model coefficients minimize the variation in the residuals. Now, it's true that if you look at the top of this plot, you can see an equation for that line. But supposing that equation wasn't shown, you might be given a table like this. This is a table for a mini tab. And you have to know that the constant is the intercept. And where the term says hours, hours is your predictor variable. And so the number next to that word hours, that's your slope. So the top number is called constant. That's your intercept. The second number has the same name as your predictor variable. That gives you the slope. And so then you can write down the equation. Y hat equals the intercept plus slope times x. So let's interpret the slope. Take a moment. Think about what the slope means in this scenario. Remember, we're looking at the number of hours a student spends using chess training software. On the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, it's the playing strength of that student at the end of 60 days. <clears throat> so, hopefully you were thinking something like this. The model predicts that for every extra hour a student trains using the chess software, their playing strength will increase by 2.248 points on average. That's the meaning of the slope in this scenario. What about the intercept? Remember in the previous example where we were looking at the, the mass of a grass snake versus its length? The intercept didn't make sense because there is no snake with mass zero. But in this case, there are students who spend zero hours using the chess software. So take a moment and think about what the intercept might mean in this case. So in this case, the model predicts that the playing strength of a student who has never played chess before and who spent zero hours using the chess software is 769 points on average. In other words, before anyone even starts training, we expect their playing strength to be 769 on average. Right, so now you can see the slope can always be interpreted. Sometimes the intercept can, and sometimes it cannot. Okay, now we're nearing the end here. Let's just do one or two more little calculations. Um, suppose a student plans to use the chess software for 30 minutes per day over those 60 days. That means that the total time spent will be 30 hours. Question, what is the predicted playing strength at the end of those 60 days? Now remember, we do have the model equation. So I want you to take a moment, pause the video if you want, just use this model equation and calculate the fitted value or the predicted outcome 
for a student who spends a total of 30 hours uh, um, using the chess software. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you manage that calculation. All you need to do is put 30 hours where you see x. So you see here, where there was an x, now there's a 30 hours. 30 hours times 2.248 plus 769 points gives us a predicted playing strength of 836 points. In other words, the model predicts that a student who spends 30 hours using the chess training software will have a playing strength of 836 points on average. Now, of course, for any individual student, the actual playing strength after 30 hours will be different. Still, this predicted value is our best estimate given the data, right? The best fitting model gives us our best possible estimate. Okay, now let's suppose the realized playing strength for that same student who studied for 30 hours, let's suppose the realized playing strength was 831 points, whereas her predicted strength, as we just calculated, was 836. What is the residual error for this student? So why don't you work that calculation? What is the residual error for this student? And you can do that while I'm making corrections. Okay, so this is the actual data point. So you can see x, the number of hours spent is 30. Uh, the, the response variable playing strength is 831 for this particular student. The residual error is just the difference between what was observed and what was predicted. So 831 points was what actually happened. 836 is what the model predicts. The difference is minus 5 points. So the residual error is minus 5. Of course, it's negative because this observation is below the line of best fit. Now, just a little conceptual question. What, why, sorry, why is the predicted value different than the actual value? And hopefully most of you are thinking it's because of individual differences. Our residuals, we can attribute to individual differences. And so the point is the model predicts the average response to 30 hours of training. In other words, if you took hundreds of people who never played chess before between ages 8 and 10, and you, you gave them this chess software, they spent some number of hours, well, 30 hours using it. At the end of the 30 hours, we're predicting that on average, their playing strength will be 836. But that's only on average. There's going to be a spread. There's going to be variation due to individual differences. So the model is predicting an average, but there are individual differences. And that explains why, for this individual student, their actual playing strength was only 831. OK, now the last thing to talk about here is when is it appropriate to use a linear regression model? There's a couple of, of rules that I'm going to give you. But first, the most important thing is we visualize the residuals and use what we see in the residuals to assess whether or not the linear model was appropriate. So remember, in the upper left-hand corner, you have your blue dots. Those are data points. Every data point has a fitted value, and the difference is a residual. So every data point has a residual. There's 25 data points. Therefore, there are 25 residuals. If we plot the residuals, here's what they look like. On the horizontal axis, we have our fitted value. Those are the y hats. On the vertical axis, we have standardized residuals. Here's the point. The residuals should have no structure. In this case, the residuals do have structure. The residuals also have plainly to see an outlier. So we have one unusual data point. 
And if you look at those residuals, you can see there is some evidence of a trend in the bulk of the data. That shouldn't be there. So in this circumstance, we can say the linear regression model is not appropriate for this data because of the structure we see in the residuals. In this case, that's a linear trend, and also because there's an outlier. So what are the rules or the, the conditions under which linear regression is the appropriate model? First, of course, the predictor and response must be quantitative variables. And when you look at the scatter plot of x versus y, it must look like there is a linear association. Second, there must be no outliers and no evidence of a lurking variable. So I've covered the idea of outliers and lurking variables in the previous lecture. And then more generally, the residuals must be structureless. Now, what does that mean for the next couple of slides to end this video? I'm just going to explain what that means. But in words, we would say that any structure in the residuals, for example, a linear trend, as we just saw, or something that we call trumpeting, or we also call a thickening of the plot, any structure of these kinds indicates the regression model is not appropriate. So let me show you examples of these. So here we have a different scenario. The scenario doesn't matter. What matters is we're looking at our standardized residuals versus fitted values. And what you can see here, as you move from left to right, the spread in the vertical direction is increasing. We call that trumpeting because the shape of the residuals resembles a trumpet. We also call that a thickening of the plot because the spread in the vertical direction is getting bigger. So the thickening of the plot condition is this. If there is thickening of the plot in the residuals versus fits, then the regression model is not appropriate. Second case, here again we have a different scenario. The scenario doesn't matter. What does matter is the standardized residuals versus fitted values versus the fitted values. You can see uh, this data cloud has a shape to it. It looks like there's some kind of nonlinear association between the residual and the fitted value. This can't be the case. This is structure in the residuals. We cannot have that. So the linear enough condition is this. If there is any linear association or nonlinear association uh, in the plot of the residuals, then the regression model is not appropriate. OK, so what I said, it's just to say that again. If there is any linear or nonlinear trend in the residuals versus fits, then the regression model is not appropriate. So when I say the residuals should be structureless, I mean they shouldn't have a thickening of the plot, and they shouldn't have any kind of trend, linear or nonlinear. What they should look like is this. So here we have a perfect example of what the residuals should look like. You can see there's no trend in these residuals, and the, the, the spread in the vertical direction is fairly constant as we move from left to right. So here the regression model is appropriate because there's no thickening of the plot, and there's no trend in the residuals. OK, and I think that is it. The last thing I'll just remind you that for this topic, there is a skill check that's already posted in Moodle. I encourage you to look at that. Probably by Wednesday, I'll have the video solution posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I'll let you know when that's posted. If you have any questions about this, this video, anything on here that wasn't clear, you can send me an email. You can leave a comment. Or you can wait until you see me on Wednesday and ask me then. Okay, so thanks for, uh, for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next class. Bye for now.